Good morning. My name is Council Gary Croft and I'm Chair of the Budget Committee. Uh, the Clerk has confirmed that we have quorum and I'd like to call meeting 45 to order uh, of the Budget Committee and this will be the last Budget Committee meeting of uh, this term. Today's meeting is being held with the members of the Budget Committee participating by video conference. Staff are also connected uh, via video conference. The public can continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at YouTube.com com slash Toronto City Council live. These measures are necessary, of course, to comply with the public health guidelines and to prevent the spread of COVID-19. I'd like to ask for, as always, patience with any delays, technical issues we do have. Uh, the clerk has provided the agenda materials via the clerk's meeting portal. Um, clerk's IT staff are also available to participants if you have issues or challenges with your devices. If there are any visiting members of council today, I also encourage you to keep your video on so we can see you. And if there's any questions, um, staff will be able to, uh, again, also uh, view you. And we'll need that for a recording of uh, attendance as well. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee, <coughs> excuse me, would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishwabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nation, First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and we acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Are there any? Seeing none. Members, this is a special meeting of the Budget Committee. Today, as I have already mentioned, is the final meeting of the 2022 budget, um, and we will be doing uh, final recommendations that will be going off to Executive Committee and from their full council on the 14th of February. I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the wrap-up notes for this meeting that have been provided by the Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer. The wrap-up notes are available on toronto.ca slash council um, Toronto, and, and to members of the council uh, on the... Uh, clerk's meeting portal. I also want to remind you that if you have any motions, you should submit them in writing to the clerk as soon as possible. Um, I'll go through the rundown of what the morning will look like uh, shortly. Uh, and again, um, these motions with your permission uh, will be shared with myself and the Executive Director of Financial Planning. We have three items on the agenda today. BU 45.1, the 2022 Capital and Operating Budgets. BU 45.2, the 2022 Operating Tax Rates and Related Matters and BU 45.3 response to Ontario Regulation 286-09 budget matters and expenses. Uh, I'd like to propose that we deal with items BU 45.2 and BU 45.3 first, and then staff will lead us through the wrap-up notes and the briefing notes that were requested by committee. If that's okay with committee, I'd like to go to BU uh, 45.2, the 2022 property tax rates and related matters. Would anybody like to hold this item? Seeing none, um, Councillor McKelvey, would you like to? I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, it, two things. I, I, I wanted to rise on a point of personal privilege oh, uh, yes, just before ahead. we started the meeting. And yes, I yep. would like to hold that item. I have a couple of questions. Okay, go ahead, uh, Councillor Lane. So on the point of privilege, um, I just wanted to take this opportunity as we have most of our city uh, senior city staff uh, here today as the councillor that represents um, sort of point zero, uh, uh, like the, the, the central focus of the weekend's activities around um, the anti-vaccination, anti-lockdown protests. I wanted to extend my deepest thanks and, and to, to all city divisions to first our, our, our mayor. Uh, for lending his leadership and voice to putting uh, into both putting into motion the efforts that the city took to anticipate and advance uh, the city's position to ensure that we didn't end up in a similar state that the city of Ottawa has been, as and and also for his voice over the course of the weekend to remind people just what a city that works together looks like, and that is people pushing to get vaccinated, working in our TCHC buildings, in our vaccination, um, in our vaccination clinics, as well as those uh, hardworking folks in the city public service and in healthcare. Um, I'd also like to thank the city manager for doing everything he can to bring uh, an enormous wealth of city resources to the planning effort, to, to the chief of police and our police services and other emergency uh, services that were involved in the response. Um, I think, 
as a result of your hard work, uh, we, we certainly uh, did not end up in a similar position that, they, uh, that the, the communities in Ottawa are now facing. And I, I wanted to express my deepest thanks to all of them, as well as all the other divisions that were involved. I am sure transportation, solid waste, TTC, MLS, all of our, all of our divisions were on board here. And as a result, what we got was a relatively peaceful protest compared to what we saw in other jurisdictions. I should also say that one thing became perfectly clear over the weekend, that in Toronto, we do not tolerate hate, we do not tolerate racism, and we do not tolerate the level of violence that we see in some places around the world, including in North America, with respect to uh, civil disobedience and, um, and, 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 and efforts to disrupt the very systems that we all depend on. All of you know, I was born with a protest sign in my hand. It should come as no surprise. The, the, the rights to protest are very deeply ingrained in my very being. But when those rights start to infringe on the rights of others, start to uh, bring hate symbols and harassing behavior, and even go so far as to block service to some people in our city, that goes too far. So again, I wanted to take the opportunity with all of you here to give you and, um, and your staff my, um, my thanks for your efforts over the weekend. Thank you, Councillor. So again, you, you're gonna be holding, uh, oh, yeah, Councillor. Mr. Mr. Chair, could I take the opportunity to rise uh, for a uh, uh, point of privilege as well? Sure, go ahead. Yes, I just want to echo Councillor Layton's comments about in Toronto, we do not tolerate any kind of racism or any kind of hate or, or uh, any type of, uh, you know, uh, hate in Toronto. I just wanted to uh, bring to the attention about, you know, it was Chinese New Year, it was Lunar New Year last week, and uh, there was uh, held bank money that was put in the red packet in at the Toronto uh, University of Toronto campus. And I've received a lot of calls and a lot of uh, dissatisfaction on this kind of uh, uh, whatever it is. I think the University of Toronto has uh, issued an apology, but these kind of thing, uh, we we were say, well, we were saying that it, it could not be unintentional, and uh, we take it as uh, offensive, and we take it uh, that I mean the Chinese community ha has taken it as very very seriously that uh, these kind of uh, things will not be uh, happened again. Uh, those are held bank money, you know, in Chinese New Year, we give out red packets for good luck and good fortune. And inside there, there's uh, only uh, hate money in there. So really, really illustrate very, very poorly that Toronto is not a city that could tolerate such gesture. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lai. Uh, so, Councillor Layton, you want to hold uh, BU uh, 45.2 for questions? Okay, sounds good. Uh, BU 45.3, response to Ontario Regulation 286-09, budget matters, expenses. Anybody want to hold that on? Somebody could move that, uh, maybe Councillor McKelvey. I'll move it. Oh, okay. Okay. Councillor McKelvey will move it. Um, all in favour? Opposed, that's carried. And again, we're holding um, one down. So why don't we go to um, BU 45.2, Councillor Layton, so we can, uh, you have questions on this item? Yeah, ju just, just very quickly. So in 2018, the then city manager issued a, um, a long-term financial plan that in the presentation notes, talked about three policy paths and, and illustrated um, what, what it would take to achieve those. And I'm curious, notwithstanding the rather, like this was all pre-COVID, right? And, um, and one of the recommendations was the level of revenue increase and expenditure, manage, expenditure management that would be needed to achieve the city building level of uh, uh, of, of finances that our, our city needed. Um, I don't know who to answer this, if it's the city manager or the CFO. Uh, I'm just curious how 
our financial session, our financial situation since since 2008, notwithstanding the COVID piece, and maybe we can't do that. Um, how we stack up? Essentially, it said we need, in order to achieve the broader city building objective, 1.4 billion over five years, in addition to what we were already doing in 2018. And I'm curious where, like, like we have increased some rev, some revenue. We have done some expenditure management, but I don't think we're quite there at 1.4 million once we factor out what we've been giving from the federal government. I just want to know, like, where are we on a spectrum? Are we at 500 million that will generate over five years, or more, or less? So, if I can, I'm just uh, through the chair. I'll make some uh, opening comments, and Heather will will. Uh provide her view as well. I mean, obviously when that was written, uh, it was prior to the world that we're in right now. I think at one of the previous meetings, um, if we get very specific, uh, we know what uh, our, our challenges right now very measurably are in the areas of transit uh, and certainly in the areas of, uh, you know, making sure our shelter system is is able to provide the kind of support that it needs to for the people who uh, require that service. So we know the problem that we have right now, uh, and we know that that problem going forward in transit is is not uh, going to diminish any time you know, soon. So we know over the next few years uh, that uh, our transit operating pressures are, are still going to be quite sizable. And then we know as well, we're bringing on service, uh, certainly the Eglinton Crosstown, and then all the transit expansion. So if ever there was a very uh, specific focus uh, that uh, we should have right now, uh, talking with the federal government, provincial government, we could begin with transit. And then, of course, you know, we have housing issues, which, Councillor, you know all too well. We are struggling trying to, you know, have the, uh, the, the resources necessary to address some of the most uh, important services that people need that have uh, found themselves homeless and now wanting to uh, you know, be able to resume uh, a better life for themselves, which, of course, means um, investments that need to be made in mental health and addiction. So, uh, and, and that has been exacerbated as a result of, of COVID as well. So, um, you know, the 1.4 over five years, I think, is um, uh, nowhere near the kinds of help that we need uh, going forward. Uh, and so, Heather, if you want, just please add to that. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, Councillor, there's a couple of initiatives that we've also introduced. As you know, the extension of the city building levy um, that has actually funded or enhanced our capital plan by $7.2 billion, as well as as of 2023, we will be introducing the vacancy home tax, which we've reflected the vacant home tax as well as funding our, our housing capital needs in the capital plan. So our 10 year capital plan has been bolstered by not only the increased revenue tool, but the extension of the city building levy. And then from a operating to a capital perspective, we also committed to becoming less reliant on MLTT, which is an un uncertain and unpredictable level of funding uh, towards the capital plan. So we've this year we were able to actually pivot and, and dedicate a certain amount of the MLTT to our capital plan. So there has been a significant amount of advancement on the capital side of the city uh, investments. Um, thank you very much. I, wh where I'm confused a little bit now, and maybe it, it, it requires me going back in, into the 2018 document is, like we we had the city building levy at that point, but the city manager of the day concluded that the cumulative revenue increase in expenditure management required would be 1.4 billion over five years. I'm not sure if that takes into account the capital spend, uh, uh, like the the long term capital spending that the like maybe maybe one of you do. Um, did, did that take it into account? So for you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, at the time that city building levy had not been extended and had not been increased. So that is is taken into account in the number that I just quoted is 7.2 billion. So that is additional revenue that is financing the capital.
yeah, but it can't possibly be that that the 1.54 billion referred to capital financing. That must have been annual because it, it just it, it couldn't possibly be that all we needed was 1.4 billion to come become city build become city builders in the city, right? Like it's the 1.4 annual. So the increase cumulative increase in the extension of the city of of the city building levy was five percent over the last four years. Is that right or four percent? It is half a percent. So so. Is half a percent? Yes. So, so there was an extension of the city building levy as well as an increase of half a percent. Increase of half a percent and an extension in this. So the total increase since 2018 would have been a five percent increase in the in the um in the levy as a result of the extension and increase in the to the city builder fund, is that right? I'm just trying to do the quick math in my head. Uh, my math would say that it's actually been a percentage. I don't know. I'm sorry. Happy to chat with you offline. I'm not sure where five percent would come from. Well, if you put, if you added 0.5 percent every year as a result of the increase, and then the extension was another one percent as a result. So the, we we're not taking the extension as an added tax. That was just a continuation of what was already in existence. So what, I, what I'm trying to establish was what the, the city manager in 2018 said, it, said we need 1.4 billion in five years, over five years. I'm just trying to figure out what we've, what we've done to get to that point. And if it was 5 million, if it was 5% in 2022, then that would be a roughly hundred and you told us thirty million for every percent, so roughly like one hundred and fifty million dollars. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Councillor. I'm not following. So, if you're asking about the one point four billion over five years, that would that would seem like it is operating funding. Um, the the amounts that I was quoting as far as the advancement that the city has made is towards the capital investments. But the capital investments are made possible by a new revenue source, which is which is contemplated on tw on slide twelve of the long term fiscal plan. And so what I'm trying to establish is how far have we gone? And it would also like it's not just that we've raised 100 or 150 million of the 1.4 billion that was suggested. Like there's also been been no doubt expended expenditure management that could account for a couple hundred million as well. Um, I have no doubt. Um, I'm just like, I'm trying to understand where we benchmark our point now to 2018 when the city manager told us he needed one was your, was last? we wanted to be city, city builders. But I don't you, know, maybe that, maybe this is a longer discussion to try to figure out how can we track our progress over time. For you, Mr. Chair, so Councillor, I, I agree with you if you were able to look at it in isolation. This is our third third year of this four year term of council that has had COVID impacts. So we're not really comparing apples to apples and there has been a significant amount of uh, cost savings that have been found and cost mitigation strategies introduced to help address COVID so that we're not 100% reliant on other levels of government to help solve the COVID pressures. Yep, fair enough, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Any other questions on BU 45.2? Councillor Carroll? Yeah, just a quick question, because this always tends to come up in the last minute at Council, and I just want to have this under my belt. I asked uh, in an earlier meeting about uh, um, that we're in the last couple of years of shift, the enhancing Toronto's business climate shift, um, and I think and people always talk about, well, do we have to do this? But, but say we do do it just to put things into a real context. Once we get there, once we finish that shift and we've created that ratio we want between residential and the commercial tax rate and, and, and subclasses, what then? Each year when we do it, um, will we will there be a parity and that the tax rate will will be the same in commercial and residential, or will the, the will will one still be a percentage of the other? For you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, I'll start and I'll ask Casey to to clarify or fill in any gaps. But yeah. once we do achieve that ratio that uh, we're striving for, and we're almost there this year, um, yeah. then again, to your point. 
there would be, uh, with the exception of multi res that will stay at zero, uh, we would then when we introduce our tax rate, that would be the tax rate. If all the ratios were on par, the tax rate would be an increase that would be shared across all classes. That's once the ratios are achieved to your point. Okay. Okay. And multi res stays at zero forever. So it's simp the only thing that recalibrates it is a, a new MPAC assessment. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the multi res stays at zero as long as the province dictates that it stays at zero. Right, right. Okay. I just wanted to have that context in case we get into this because, you know, we sometimes look at it as can we delay this and have a have a, a, a funding source. And in fact, we're so close, it, we, it's not something we should look at at this point. Would that be your view? I'm putting you on the spot. I'm asking you for an opinion. So through you, Mr. Chair, Councillor, we're actually almost there. Yeah. Uh, we were almost there this year. Yeah, yeah. The, okay. the, the small business subclass just actually backed us off ever so lightly, uh, slightly, I should say, um, but we actually are almost there. Right. And and really that that's an important we're just taking that 30% rate and giving making it 15% for that most impacted group. So I think that's important context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Any other questions on this item? Okay, seeing none, um, uh, speakers, I'll speak first quickly, uh, very quickly. Um, I'm going to move the staff uh, recommended um, recommendations. Um, in this, we have uh, a 2.9% operating uh, increase. Uh, that is, though a little bit higher than years past, uh, has been up to the continued the commitment the mayor and I have made to keep property taxes at or below the rate of inflation. Um, recognize, and we do have the 1.5, which is a city building uh, fund that Councillor Layden was and Carol were mentioning. Um, again, this is recognizing they're a little bit higher than in, in years past. Uh, the staff have done an incredible job of keeping our operating expense low enough so we could, I look at this 2.9 as as low as we can get it this year to be able to retain all the important services across the city. But at the same time, being able to look at how do we manage, you know, in, in a COVID budget year. Um, last year, as an example, we had record low uh, inflation rates. I think it was 0.7 or way, way below 1%. So if you, you look at an average over a couple of years, I think it's still an affordable budget or affordable raise. So I'll be moving staff recommendations on the uh, property tax rates. Any other speakers? Okay, all in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Okay, now we're going to jump over to um, BU. 45.1, which is the capital and operating budgets. Uh, Steve Conforti is going to take us through the supplementary. But before that, I just want to recognize the CFO um, that wants to bring some uh, <clears throat> information or small changes or some changes that uh, she's recommending to the, uh, or the, the uh, city manager be recommending to the uh, budget process today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I did uh, point out last week that the city has been actively engaged with uh, colleagues across the greater Toronto Hamilton area. We have been working together, uh, as I mentioned in the budget presentation, uh, since the onset of COVID, since COVID surfaced, looking for new solutions to help tackle problems that we're all experiencing. One of the areas of focus is procurement. And in the area of procurement, we have had the support of an external consultant uh, that was funded through the Provincial Audit and Accountability Fund to help us find efficiencies in how we procure. And that work, that detailed analysis, analyzed data from, from the municipalities, including Toronto and our purchasing habits. And there is an opportunity to find, to make a commitment, to set a target, to find additional efficiencies. I've worked closely with Mike Patchelock on this, the Chief Procurement Officer, and we do feel confident that in 2022, based on the work that we have done, uh, the analysis that is done, that we can commit to a savings target of $3 million. This is ongoing work. The workshops are being held on a monthly basis. And so just based on the workshop that was held just over a week ago, uh, we felt confident in bringing it forward that we could, could commit to a $3 million savings target for the 2022 fiscal year. 
So I just wanted, in the spirit of transparency, I wanted to raise that and, and share that with you. So just, and again, just to confirm, uh, thanks Heather on that, um, but I'll, I'll, and members, I'll be moving a motion um, when we get into speaking that will actually bring that, those funds into the budget. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that that will be taking place just technically to get those, those funds, I guess, on, on the, uh, on the table, I guess, for, for budget. One and uh, Steve, um, any other questions? Just uh, sorry if, uh, just, if there's any questions on Heather on on what she just uh, made available or announced to us, Councillor Carroll. Did you? Uh, and then, uh, then we'll go to we'll go to Steve after that. I just wanted to. This was a little different out of, outside of the agenda, so just but we could entertain some questions. I think. Well, I, yeah, I'm just wondering if we're is it wise to incorporate it in the budget right this very minute. Um, I, I think we need to, to seek your advice. The transparency is very much appreciated, but it is, it is still a target. It's a savings target. You're, you're not telling us you found cash. You, you, you're telling us that through the year you'll find it. We are still also um, holding a significant gap in the budget because we're waiting for a response on our COVID expenses from, from other orders of government. So. Well, we might incorporate that in the budget. Should we rush to spend it, or shall we uh, uh, should we transmit this budget to executive with whatever minor changes there are today, and and uh, still wait to see what that intergov response is? Through you, Mr. Chair, Councillor. As I said, I was I you know it, that is a decision that budget committee can make. I just wanted to identify that there is ongoing work that supports um, the ability to find savings. The problem right now is we don't specifically know which program uh, would be impacted. So to allocate it to a specific program is a challenge. The other piece I do wanna highlight is that um, the amount that we're hoping to achieve will be spread out over four different budgets because we have rate operating and rate capital. We have operating tax supported operating and tax supported capital. And so from a tax supported operating perspective, again, not knowing specifically which divisions would be impacted, we are ah. saying that across procurement, we're confident that we are going to, we have already found some, but we are going to find savings. And so again, it, to, to be handled the way co uh, committee decides, I just wanted to share that there is an opportunity that we are confident that we would be able to find it. Okay, okay, thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. This is welcome news. Uh, thank you very much to the CFO uh, for your work on this. Could, could we just, so this is annual funding, year over year savings that we, we'd be able to achieve? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what it is, is when we look at our contracts, um, and the pricing that we would be able to negotiate through alternate arrangements, through purchasing cooperation, cooperative uh, arrangements, that we feel that the prices will be reduced. The prices of some certain services will be reduced. Okay, so, so those savings would be realized year over year? In theory, unless there are cost escalations, correct. But there would be cost es escalations if we were purchasing them just as the Corporation of the City of Toronto. Um, have we learned anything that changes our sort of institutional purchasing about when we when do we go in? Like, is there a protocol we've established now when we know we need something? When do we say, hey, this is something that we're all going to need. Let's bring it to this table and start shifting things over. Or is there something that we can start undertaking to get out of contracts that we might be able to do cheaper? Have, have we explored either of those two things? Through the chair, actually, councillor, it's both. Um, what we've done through the help of a consultant, we have looked at and analyzed the purchasing habits and data that we have. And through that, we're saying, could we come together? And I'll give you an example. The city of Toronto did a fuel contract we invited other municipalities to participate in. So that is a change in the way we're operating from a regional perspective. Um, there will be opportunities in the IT sector on how we purchase software and equipment. There will be opportunities in uh, 
consulting fees. There will be opportunities in construction fees. So these are all, I would say, uh, themes, category themes that we're looking at. We're looking at timing. We're looking at uh, existing cooperative entities that already exist that have relationships in the marketplace. Another example is uh, something that the city has already engaged in, and that's through Mohawk Medby, which is the supply chain arm for the pro provincial healthcare system. And so what we've been able to access is value through accessing scarce resources in the time of you know, huge demands in PPE and rapid tests. So these cooperative purchasing arrangements are going to derive benefits in many ways. So we're looking at different aspects of it. So we joined a bunch of co-ops? That's great. We did. Um, could I just, just one more question. So you, you mentioned in your example that the city of Toronto was inviting other municipalities. So we realize a benefit because we can purchase in, in a higher quantity. What do th those, those municipalities realize a benefit because they can't possibly purchase at the scale that we're purchasing. So we're driving down their costs. Do, is there a management fee for that? Like, w w if we're m monitoring those contracts, are are we giving passing on all the savings to those other partners, or is there an arrangement that is made where we perhaps pay for our staff time? I'm not saying we gouge Uxbridge, but like, w if we're paying staff to manage contracts that include others, is 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 that recouped somewhere? So through you, Mr. Chair, actually, Councillor, it's not that we're managing contracts on behalf of others. We're negotiating contracts that allow others to use the same terms and conditions. But in turn, that's not just something that Toronto is leading. Other, what we're doing right now as a region, we're giving up the, the opportunity to actually go out and identify the opportunities. So it's not just Toronto Resources leading it. Okay. We're, we're actually sharing that amongst uh, the different municipalities. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hina. Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Lai. I don't know whether this is the right place, but I, I do have a couple of questions about the breathing notes number uh, 21 and 22. So we'll is be getting to that next. We're oh, just, okay. Th th I just, this was just a few questions on uh, what the uh, CFO had in us. Okay. So next step will be that opportunity, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so on that, why don't we, uh, Steve uh, Conforti, Executive Director of Financial Planning, I'll pass it over to you to go through the supplementary and briefing notes that are before us. Great, thank you. Um, so for today's meeting, we, we again have a package uh, of our wrap-up notes available. They're available uh, both on the city's budget website as well as on the, uh, the clerk's uh, portal. So we'll start off with supplementary reports where there are two items that have been uh, referred to the budget. The first is BU 45.1K, uh, and this is a letter from the City Librarian on the Toronto Public Library Board's 2022 operating budget. Um, in terms of the budget itself, as it relates to the base budget, as well as COVID-19 related impacts, the budget is consistent with the staff recommended budget that, uh, that uh, the city has brought forward. Where the budgets differ are on the new and enhanced side. Um, specifically uh, on the elimination of fines, the staff recommended budget includes 600,000 for the elimination of overdue fines for teens and adults, which differs from the board recommended amount. And then the second piece is the board approved budget includes a request for enhanced services related to digital literacy for seniors and community librarians outreach services that are not included in the city's recommended budget. Uh, and just as a point of clarity, the difference only relates to the request for enhanced services. There is no reduction included in the staff recommended budget as it relates to existing services or service levels within the library budget. So I'll pause there for any questions. Any questions on that? Seeing none. Okay, next, Steve. Great, thanks. Uh, the next item is BU 45.1L, uh, and this is a letter from City Council referring item DM 39.3 titled Extending Repayment Due Date for Eligible Properties from the 2020 Property Tax Deferral Program to Budget Committee. Um, 
this, uh, there's a recommendation that was uh, referred to the budget process. This is not consistent with what's currently within the city's recommended operating budget. Uh, there are financial details that are provided in a briefing note that was just submitted this morning, uh, turned around from council last week. Uh, appreciating that not all uh, budget committee members may have had an opportunity to review that briefing note just yet. Um, so just at a very high level, uh, the financial impacts identified in the briefing note are around 21,000. Um, there's also concerns that were raised around potential inequities for approved program applicants where over 99% have now paid their taxes in full. So I'll pause there if there's any questions. Questions, Councillor Lai. Can you help me to understand that uh, this is uh, referring to 2020 and 2021? Uh, so, what about the 2022 property tax? Uh, are there any uh, initial, I mean, deferral program or anything that to be done for the 2022 cycle? Uh, through the chair, I can start, and I believe we have Casey on the line that can speak to this further. But this is in regards to a property tax deferral program that was initiated on the onset of the pandemic, and it allowed for property tax deferral to November tw uh, 30th, 2020. There have been no deferral programs uh, beyond that date. Casey, I don't know if you have anything to add. Uh, thank you, Stephen. You can hear me uh, through you, uh, Mr. Budget Chief, to Councillor Lai. Uh, Stephen is correct. Um, Council only adopted a deferral program for pandemic in the 2020 taxation year. Um, there was no further relief provided or approved by Council in 2021 um, or subsequently. So basically, staff is not recommending uh, to help any of those people that are kind of COVID related for the year 2022 uh, property tax. Am I correct? Uh, correct, not through any form of property tax relief. There are other programs that have been made available through the provincial government for to offset things, expenses and property tax and utility payments, but not, uh, not through the city's uh, property tax. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the uh, for the answers. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I just had one. I don't know if Casey, if it's with you or the uh, CFO. Um, is there an equity issue here um, with regard to um, businesses who um, followed the process, uh, got the submissions in on time, compared to the, those few who um, did not get them in time, and hence why? When there's a bit of a, a, a sort of conundrum because um, you know this is really about those who didn't get it in on time and, and there were extra charges. So can you just talk about this whole program and and the challenge we're facing as council, even though it's not a lot of money uh, up front, but the, the the equity issue on 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 supporting something like this? Uh, yes, I will respond, Mr. Budget Chair. Um, thank you. Yes, in fact, the program as it was set out um, provided. Uh, a waiver of interest and penalty for a six month period, June to the end of November in 2020, provided that the taxes were paid in full by the end of November of 2020. And of the, of the, uh, all of the applicants, uh, 210 applicants understood the program, repaid their funds and took full advantage of that deferral program. 50 applicants to the program that had been approved failed to repay the taxes in full by that November date. So uh, the, the, the program required that in that case, if you didn't repay in full, then the full amount of interest and penalties that were assessed during that six month period would apply. That's what's been the case until now. And so, yes, if you, took the deferral, if you played by the rules that were set out, yes, you would have received the full benefit of the deferral. Um, what this motion does is provides an extended benefit to 50 additional properties who didn't repay by that November 30th due date, but they did pay their taxes in full for 2020 within six months of that date. So we're giving a six month extension. So to that extent, we're providing a benefit to 46 additional properties. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, clarification. Um, seeing no other questions, Steve, we can go on to the next. Great, thanks. 
Um, so the next section of the wrap up notes uh, is section two, and this is where we're, uh, we're able to run through the briefing notes that were submitted for today's uh, budget committee meeting. So in total, there are uh, five briefing notes that have been submitted. So I'll start off with briefing note number 22 for municipal license and standards, uh, which is the MLS staffing levels for general and dedicated enforcement units, performance indicators for rent safe TO and rapid response bylaw enforcement. Questions, Mr. Chair? Yep, Council Carroll, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so questions on this one. Um, we have we have 40 positions to hire, including the uh, including the six uh, positions that are for new tasks. Um, I should have maybe I should have asked for this detail in the briefing note. Um, are are we uh, the 40 positions we need to hire? We're going to start a program. Are we are we up against it here? Is this a difficult position to hire? There are. 26 bylaw enforcement officers. So through the chair, thank you for the question. We have an active competition on right now that started with 800 applicants, went down to 132 that went through an assessment and now 80 passed that. And now we are interviewing those 80 and we plan to hire uh, 40 and more if possible, if we get qualified candidates. Where it's a difficult uh, to hire is it, is you, you can't do a one of it needs to be a large class and that's how we've done it and if we if we again continue to need more staff we will hire a second class in uh, in the summer or in the fall okay and um and here's the here's the big question once they're there how easy is it to keep them do, have we covered off on things as have we done a uh the pay equity exercise on this group or have we compared it to other positions in the city? Do we lose bylaw officers to other postings in the city? Or do, if, if they leave, do we lose them mostly to retirement or are we losing them to other cities once they've trained here? Um, I, I would start by saying that this is a difficult position uh, and it's a, it's a hard job and these people do, uh, do phenomenal work. We do lose, um, staff to transportation to fire to other municipalities and many off to uh, the police college which is again many of them their ultimate goal so uh, there is a lot of turnover uh, but we also have a lot of people with 30 and 35 years experience and we yeah. do get people retiring so it's a mixture of of all of those items that i mentioned yeah yeah so i i wondered about that because i worried about losing them to other uh, uh divisions have we done the pay equity exercise or do we know that we're, we're comparing their wages to the right comparators? Because it, it is very difficult work. The public interfaces with some of the most difficult people in the city to, to have to, to, to work with. Have we, have we measured their, their uh, pay scale and working conditions against the, the right comparators in your view across the city? Or have we even done that exercise yet? I believe we've done the comparator with transportation services, but I don't think we've done an extensive uh, jurisdictional scan with other municipalities or the province. Uh, and that's a body of work that we could undertake and likely should undertake. Well, is there is there not a federal deadline uh, looming in a couple of years, at which we, we have to have done that? Um, I'm not certain, but it, it is something that uh, we will look into. Okay, so it's something that we should maybe uh, bring to committee or bring to executive and, and look at in a policy sense, because it would certainly help you in in the staffing and budget sense. Uh, that's correct. Okay, okay. Thank you for the briefing note. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Councillor Carroll. Councillor Lai, then Nunziata after that. Councillor Lai. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the briefing notes. Uh, there are currently 272 approved enforcement positions um, in MLS, but about 10%, about 26 of them are vacant. Am I correct? Uh, that is correct. Uh, just to clarify, um, of the 272, 239 are your bylaw officers, and 33 are with uh, our enforcement officers in animal services. Oh, I see. Okay. 
So I noticed in the briefing note that it says position can, can be filled by modifying training components. What does that mean in practice? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing that, but um, we are looking to hire as quickly as possible. We we are not modifying our training uh, components to make them shorter or uh, less less um, less thorough. It's more about customizing how we deliver training. Training is critical to this position, and uh, I just don't want it to be construed as um, as differently. It's about dedicated and customized uh, training. I see. My last question would be, I noticed that there are two of the four positions in rooming house enforcements are, are currently unfilled. First, is, is there only, only four people that are assigned to, to this uh, task across the city? And uh, my second question would be, uh, when are you intending to fill those other vacant, the two vacant positions? Uh, so through the budget. Chief, uh, there are six positions in this dedicated unit that does multi-tenant housing across the city. You're correct. There's four active and two uh, vacancies. Those two will be filled in the, um, in the competition that we have going on right now. And what's the timeline for now? Uh, would it be uh, very, very soon? Yeah, they're in the interview uh, session, so then it will be training and we hope to have them uh, on the road, I believe, April. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Those are my questions. Thank you, Carlton. Thank you, Councillor Nunziata. <clears throat> Thank you, Carlton. Uh, Carlton, uh, so as far as the, uh, the classes, how long um, is the training? How many, is uh, it weeks or months or? It, it is three weeks. Uh, it is three in weeks? class and then we put them with a, uh, with another off a senior officer to do training in the field. Okay. Um, now, when they go through the training, um, are they trained specifically for um, certain um, issues? Like, or, or all they are they all trained the same way, and you can send them different in different areas? So, through the budget chief, that's a great question. We have um, we do general training for all of them, and then yeah. we have modified training sessions if we know we have uh, again. You know what? We have to fill a number of vacancies on RentSafe or a number of vacancies on, on another team. We would have dedicated training specific to that. So we do a general training, and then where we know we have a larger number of vacancies and we're sending five and six and eight people to those dedicated teams, we provide uh, specific training. So staff are able to fill in um, in, in other areas because they're, because they're trained, correct? Correct. Uh, it is it is challenging, and it, that is one of the I guess items that Councillor Carroll was bringing up that we spend a lot of time investing in uh, someone doing noise training, which is very specific and very measured, and they may transfer out of that group in a year, and yeah. um, that's that's the challenge and retraining people. Uh, so it does take time. It is something we are aware of, and is something we are building into our our training program. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no questions, uh, Steve, you want to go on to the next? I'm, I'm sorry, I've got a question. Oh, sorry, Councillor, I didn't see that. That's okay. okay. Thanks. Go ahead. So, my question is about the service level standards. So, the point, the first point on page two is service level standards are established for the different service models, um, but that there's an impact of the the vacancies on attaining those. Um, how is or or how could we improve some of the more life safety related standards that MLS under undertakes, like rent safe, like uh, because I, I I acknowledge that there's quite the delay in implementation of rent safe as well as um, uh, monitoring uh, rooming houses. Um, so, a couple of things there. Um, with RentSafe, first, it is responding to, um, you know, service requests that have come in from <clears throat> a tenant. And um, our times are not that, that um, 
that low. We do get out to them. It's the issue is we do not correct the problem. We work with the property manager and the property managers contractors to fix the uh, the issue. We do not have the toolbox to fix um, items in RentSafe. However, it's important that we get out there and we meet with the tenant and we understand the issue and we press upon the uh, the landlord and the property manager to take the appropriate action to correct that issue. So can you give me an idea of what that service standard looks like and then the follow up? So to responding to a tenant's concern or potentially a call from Toronto Fire, right? Um, you could be getting those as well. Uh, we would work with fire, but in the briefing note lower on pages uh, six and seven, it talks about the number of days and median number of days to respond to uh, to various issues. Uh, and the, the the timing is not, uh, you know, median number of days by category is consistent with the last four years. If I'm looking at the average at 1.4 days to get out there, um, it's kind of consistent with how it has been in the past. We were we we're doing a little bit better than in 2018, where we were at 2.1 days. So I'm looking at the top of page six, is the numbers that I'm referring to. So the average number of days to get to a property standard issue is, um, you're, we're looking at 6.5 this past year on the bottom of page five, right? Correct. Sorry, I was reading, uh, that's correct. I was reading the next category with median number of days, but yes, you're right. <coughs> the the Property standards issues are typically not necessarily emergency. So, so let's, where, where am I looking for the rent safe piece? The, the property standards issues as they relate to life safety. I would say uh, adequate heat, which is the second category. So that's around 1.5 days. Yeah, correct. Property standards, if it was structural, uh, we would need to get out there sooner and need to take those actions quicker. But uh, when you think of traditional property standards, it's it's the garbage being correct. But the garb garbage garbage is waste. waste. So the waistline, the long grass. There's a bunch of those taken out. So where else do we fall under the like on the property standards line? Right. So it could be, you know, uh, spalling paint in the underground parking garage, you know, uh, handrails, um, you know, chipped paint, uh, things along those lines. Graffiti. So when we're looking at the light, life safety related ones, there, there, there would be the adequate heat piece, but that's beyond heat, right? Yeah, we also have things with flooding or if there were sewage backups, those would be uh, uh, important. Broken but, windows. And they would, they would fall under property standards. Uh, that's correct. So what would it take to, or what complement would you need in order to improve specifically the, um, the service request times for health and safety related elements of rent safe and the rooming houses? Uh, so that's always a difficult question um, to, to determine an, you know, an exact number of officers. Uh, obviously an increase in complement would uh, assist with that, but it's, it's, uh, it's important, you know, I, I can't say you know, 12, 10, 15, it's, it's difficult uh, to, to give a number um that would because it's it's challenging to make it one for one for for these types of uh these types of asks and if i uh, just on on one more question so your officers work on follow-up as well correct that is correct so the numbers these numbers are on um specifically um on um investigation response time so your officers go to investigate um, the follow-up that, that it takes, is there, do you, do you have a measure of how long it takes officers to address the adequate heat issue or other property standards issues? So not only like to close the cases, not only 
investigate them, but ensure a remedy has been. Completed. Yeah, so what, what I'm seeing based on our data is, uh, again, we, we investigate, I mean, sorry, we respond to the call, we investigate them, may include multiple visits, but uh, adequate heat is uh, eight days uh, as an average and, and um, three days as a median average. I'm sorry. Is sorry, not a median, not a median average, median three days for adequate heat. And the other example was again on page six, adequate heat is in eight days, and that's down from 14 in 2018. Yeah. But, but is that just to investigate or is that to resolve? It's your last question. Um that the that the file is closed, which means that it is towards resolution that the property manager and the contractor is, you know, on site. Okay. Thank you. Seeing other questions, um, Steve, I think we're good to go on to the next. Sure. So uh, we'll move over to corporate services where there are two briefing notes, both from Environment and Energy. The first one is briefing note number 20. And it is the 2022 Environment and Energy Division staffing work plan and reports to council and committee. Questions? Seeing none. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Councilor. Yeah. My apologies. Um, my question was, and I'm just trying to find it, was about the advancements that will be required to and I, I think there's some overlap between planning and um and ed so maybe ed can tell me if i should be asking planning um staffing requirements for tgs for the enhanced tgs to advance that work um because we've tried uh, the last council direction was to shave a couple years off of the toronto green standard um that i don't see that in your work plan Uh, through the chair, it's uh, Greg Winter and uh, Councillor Eight. Maybe I can help you. That'd be uh, great. Uh, if I understand your question correctly, uh, Council approved the new green standard mid-year 2021, um, moving us to version four uh, by May 1st, 2022. Um, in that report, we did not report any financial impact because version four. Uh, just as we have implemented previous versions um, are implemented through the site plan approval process. They're embedded in the site plan approval process. So we reset the standard, but the staff who are currently deployed to work on site plan continue to, to do that work based on the new standard. So um, we are not in, uh, envision, envisioning um, a staffing implication um, in order to advance the version four, at least from a development review point of view. So, but direction from council was to, in, in not in the existing or or in the uh, the TGS report in November, but in January's report on I think it was January, uh, December, um, in the transform TO report, the direction from council was to advance us to the hot, to the higher tiers faster. Um, that would require that that necessitated a report back um, and some consultation with industry. Is that right. something right. that like that that we're we're preparing for? Because I suspect that would need to start relatively quickly. But I I, I believe um, if I can think about that, the the that would be what I would call policy work first. So our policy staff will have to turn their attention to. To that together working with uh environment and climate division i think they're now called and uh and and for further recommendations then to 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 be brought forward and whether or not there are staffing implications with that we would have to determine it at that time likely at some point yeah and i can add so, to that uh, uh council late night this is uh fernando curva from environment energy so as you know we work actually really closely with uh, greg and his team um, so what we have actually is a, uh, a policy, um, you know, sort of action to look at accelerating 
in terms of uh, the complement, actually, it's a function actually of the amount of applications. So we have actually well underway. Uh, we review over 200 applications in a year that come in through planning uh, for compliance with China Green Standard. So we don't see actually the operational work, like Greg indicated, um, to be actually affected you know, by acceleration of the TGS. But we do have actually obviously the uh, the outreach, you know, with the um, uh, with the industry uh, to signal, you know, readiness in terms of uh, you know soft services, you know, all the uh, the uh, um, products I guess that would have to actually be, uh, you know, coming to market you know, earlier than uh, than it was actually uh, communicated for the 2030 uh, deadline. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. So I'm just trying to get an idea of is it realistic that we have. Like, I know that Greg's policy staff aren't underworked, um, given the number of reports they punch out on an annual basis. I also know that, like, we're, we have outstanding reports from many years ago for their policy staff around um, right. ar around chain stores and, and uh, multi, uh, uh, like, like um, chain retail and, a, like, obviously a slew of other things related to cultural districts. Um, I'm just... I'm curious, do we have the capacity, because the, the advancement was 2030 to 2028, meaning everything gets ratcheted up faster. So we have to do the consultation and report and, and write a report back, probably in that work probably needs to be done in 22, 23. And I'm wondering, do we have the policy capacity within planning and EED um, to, to achieve that? Uh, Council, the answer is yes, we do. Uh, so that's in, within my team. I should work with the environment uh, policy team. I should within Greg's team. Um, so we have actually the staffing, and we're going to bring in as part of Transform TO, as you know, uh, new FTS. Uh, hopefully, middle of this year, as the budget gets uh, organized, and and we have, uh, you know, we can prioritize, you know, from people in equity. Uh, we do have vacancies uh, that we're going to fill, and we do have actually new FTEs you know, coming in, which will be assigned to uh, to this work. And Greg, do you does your policy unit have the capacity to deliver? We have five FTEs in our strategic initiatives unit that work on environment policy, and they will continue as we have every year to reset their work program. Uh, we, we're delivering two key matters this year, the updated environmental policy reports for the official plan review. Sorry, updated environmental policy for the uh, official plan review that's uh, part of the MCR and working with uh, environment and climate on advancing or uh, acceleration of the uh, Calgary standard. Thanks, Joseph. Okay, I just, I just wanted to be very clear. Halfway through the year when we don't have these reports done, Please don't say your staff are overworked and you couldn't use more staff because we've done everything we can to advance it at budget here. And obviously I can't move a request to assign more policy staff when you say you don't need it to achieve council direction. So sorry. I think, I think councilor, the, the ch one of the challenges that we, these are specialized people with, with background in this area. And if somebody happens to leave or retire or resign, uh, I can't manage that turnover uh with such a small number of people so there there are i'm not saying there aren't challenges but uh as far as i can see at the moment we're staffed to work with environment and climate to advance this matter thanks yeah. councillor seeing no other questions steve go on to the next a couple more left so uh the next briefing note again uh from environment and energy is briefing note number 23 in your materials uh entitled funding for transform to net zero short-term actions questions councillor mckelvey uh thank you mr chair okay so i'm looking through the number and it says 145 billion over the next 30 years um and then the net impact when you take into account is 57 billion. Okay, so I have a few questions and I appreciate this is a modeled number and it's very, very early and there's lots of work being done in this area. So um, does this take into account work that would be done with state of good repair anyway or needed to be factored into this? For the chair, I'm gonna ask Cecilia maybe to respond to the, the model number. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor. Um, 
I believe that, yes, the state of good repair is included in this, um, particularly for um, uh, transit. I will, I will have to check back though into those details. I don't have them ready with me, so I can, I can provide those uh, to you offline if, if that's appropriate. Okay, and then on the includes transit, um, because you had the second section that said investment in public transit to meet net zero, um, are the numbers incorporated into that, you know, uh, 145-57 number? Uh, yes, again, through the chair. So those numbers are modeled numbers using uh, what was provided to us from the TTC at the time the model was taking place. So they have not been updated um, since kind of, you know, mid last year. Um, okay. So I guess we would have to go back and, and confirm whether or not there's alignment currently. But So but they need to also the, be updated to be net zero by 2040 now instead of 20 zero by 2050. Yeah, and I think our briefing okay. note does state that that's the work that needs to be done is, is that refinement. Okay. How are we working with other municipalities um, on this type of modeling? And how are we sharing it with other levels of government? Or, or I mean, or maybe we're not there yet, but is that the end goal? Like, cause you know, we can't fund climate action alone, right? Like everybody has to have a part in this. The chair, uh, I would I would say we're, we're not there yet. I mean, we, we have the information from Transform TO available, but we're starting I think mean, continuing some of the discussions with other uh, levels of government and municipalities around the specifics of that, as well uh, as noted in the note, we've got more work to do within divisions in terms of refining our numbers, kind of going beyond the model into more specifics. And we'll also be looking at the role of other levels of government, potential partnerships that we can, we can have in place um, to address uh, some of the resourcing or or non-resource requirements. So as we update those numbers, is the goal that we kind of get it almost like a menu so that as programs are rolled out by the province or are rolled out by the feds, we can start to pick projects that fit with their funding mechanisms and start to kind of apply for them. Like, are we giving thought to the way we're laying this out so we can kind of pick and choose and have that nimbleness in it? Through the chair, I'd say both that and also so we can advocate in terms of our needs, looking at where our, uh, the greatest opportunities are in terms of reduction, um, but also where we feel that uh, other levels of government, uh, other, other uh, actors um, share our responsibility and can contribute to this. So it, it'll, it'll also enable us to identify you know, where funding can align to others' programs, but also to advocate uh, for funding in various areas where we think there's there's opportunity or there's a need for funding and, and support for our pathway. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing any, any other questions? Okay, next, Steve. Sure, so uh, the next is a briefing note from the City Manager and Finance and Treasury Services. It's briefing note uh, number 21. Uh, entitled Summary of Filled, Vacant, and Temporary Positions and Details on the 2022 Budget Offsets. Councillor Carroll, then Councillor Lai. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you for this. This is a, this is a very big view <laughs> of things. Um, so we have two things going on here. Um, I'm looking at the, the ongoing challenge uh, paragraph on page two. That that first of all that that our exit from the corporation rate is up. We have you know an additional 900 staff members left the corporation, um, uh, bringing us to 10 percent. But the second uh, statement is, and that one I I figure is a, a function of uh, people are desperate for staff, so. We're getting poached, and and uh, we're we've got a staffing freeze, so that or a staff uh, uh, cost of living freeze, so that makes sense. However, the second one, internal staff filling vacant positions, um, uh, fifty five percent of all vacancies typically filled internally, resulting in six additional vacancies. That is, this is the knock on effect. They move, so someone else has to move, etc. Is that what that is? Through the chair, uh, yes, that's exactly what it is. As we fill one position, we have to then 
fill the other positions behind them, and they typically, again, repeat the same uh, and will be coming from internal staff. Okay. And do we have, do we have, uh, um, is this, is this sort of within the division usually, or are, are people sort of just get into the corporation, then jump around from division to division? And, and so there's, there's churn going laterally and up the ladder. Yes, through, through the chair, that's exactly it. As, uh, as um, employees join the city, there's obviously great opportunities in career advancement and development. And so we get, as you can see, a majority of our vacancies filled in that manner. And that it's outside of divisions across the corporation more generally. So it seems to me that would keep that, that alone, uh, dealing with the internal impact, that, that would keep our human resources uh, team very, very busy. Um, are we uh, are we sure that uh, are we sure that we're in each division? Is there a, a, an internal HR uh, um, succession plan such that you know people can see the opportunities within a division that they that they 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 uh, uh, really look within their division before starting to jump around the corporation so that. So that people really have a, a good idea of their opportunity and their advancement, if they keep their expertise where they've developed it. Uh, through the chair, um, there's two points there. I'll do the first one first. So recruitment is centralized, um, and the ability that gives us is uh, an, a way to kind of manage our recruitment in a more efficient way. So it's centralized. The, vac the vacancies come through us. Uh, and in that way, we were able to then turn around and work with those divisions to get the right people in. In regards to the opportunities within division, uh, although we obviously have the movement across the corporation, there will be, as you, as you can well imagine, a number of roles that actually do have a progression, right? So you come in, you develop, and you go for the promotion within that division in some of our specialized areas. And so that we see a lot of that, and obviously in some ways that's excellent, and in some ways that's been difficult for the, the division as they continue to deliver their services. So you have a bit of both, but the fact that we're centralized allows us really to uh, make sure that uh, we can do it in a timely manner and use more resources and lean in a bit more when we need to, to ensure that divisions get what they need and, and when they need it. And so, um, the, at the end of the day, the, the big question budget wise is, is, do you have enough resources? Uh, cause this, what this briefing note tells us is that, you know, you have that, is that hiring, uh, into the corporation, big programs like MLS, uh, uh, needing to hire classrooms at a time, uh, planning has a lot of churn and, and they're always bringing people in, but you have all of this work to do just internally. Uh, one person moving up creates six knock-on effect vacancies. Are you confident that you have enough resources? Because often we hear we do, we adopt the budget, and then you you, you get scapegoated <laughs> when we ask people why they're not ready to do something. They say we haven't hired them yet. It's HR. Have you got <laughs> enough resources to meet the the demands here? Because it looks very demanding. Yeah, through the chair, I think we have learned over the last two years with, uh, with the pandemic uh, that we had the ability last year to, to resource up, and we did uh, almost double inside dedicated recruitment consultants. We did a number of things just to be able to mobilize a lot quicker, so that's enabled us to be in a really good position, and we're starting to really see the results of that uh, by um, employing and filling positions uh, high numbers in the last uh, in December we filled over 1,800 positions. We wouldn't normally do that in a December. It's like 500 pre-pandemic. So we can see that with that investment uh, that was made throughout the year to increase our resources, uh, we obviously now need to maintain it at that level so that we can continue Great. to do. Uh, and then that we're pretty confident in that way we'll be able to meet the needs across and also improving some of the things that we do and how we do it. Uh, that's where we've been. A little bit more creative and trying to get ways uh, introducing staffing agencies to help us in some of the components, um, et cetera. So, so yeah, we're in a, in, a, in a much better position to be able to deliver uh, the needs of the corporation. Okay. 
Thank you, Thanks, Mr. Counselor. Chair, for that. Any other questions? Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for the briefing note. I, I think I think it's one that I asked for, and it seems to be exactly what I was looking for. And it highlighted specifically the number that I was trying to get to. And that's the um, vacant full-time equivalent positions, uh, mm -hmm. which would suggest that our, our vacant FTEs are around 10% of the complement. Um, in the past, we would have called this gapping. Um, or acknowledged it in our budget as gapping the cost, the, the value of that time. Should we have a full complement? I remember a couple years ago, and I can't remember the exact number. So I'm looking for some advice. What's a healthy gapping number? What is a healthy number of vacant positions? It'll happen. Like, I'm not saying this number can be zero. It can't be zero or else you're, you're staffing up before you know that you need the staff members. I get that. But what is a healthy gapping number number of expected fdes not to be in a full complement for a year because i remember in the, in the past we've been around and i may be mistaken like three to five percent and we're up around 10 right now is there is there a standard here uh so through the chair i actually i don't know what the standard gapping number is but i just wanted to clarify one thing that we do have that the um, vacancy number is shared in the briefing note. However, 80% of those roles are actually in a process of recruitment. So it will always show as a vacant position um, at the time that we pull the report, but that doesn't include the fact that we're screening, we're interviewing, we're offering jobs. Until those bodies are in position, they'll, you'll always yeah, have that. But, but your, so, your report also acknowledges that you're probably gonna lose 10% this year. So, Absolutely. right, so, so our gapping is always fluid. I get that. You have ins and outs, ins and outs, ins and outs, ins and outs. But at any given time, like the time this report was pulled, we were 10% lower than we should be. And they, we used to acknowledge it through a, um, a the gapping number, which was a target that we didn't want to go over, but we probably, we like, certainly we, we couldn't really go under because we didn't gap, we didn't budget for under. So I'm just curious what, like, what that, is there a healthy rate? I think, I, I think Councillor Davis asked for a briefing note about this like five years ago, which I, I may go through and, and, and try to find, but I'm trying to see how that number has changed over the last 10 years. Okay. Well, if I can through the chair and, and Marcia, you're gonna correct me here. And, and it's, it's interesting, Councillor, you mentioned three to 5%, I think, you know, I, I think our goal here is around 4%. Is it not, Marcia, that we're trying to, I mean, it, it's almost like unemployment. Uh, it, it's like, there's no such thing as zero unemployment because there's always people in transition. So the number that I think you hear nationally uh, on that particular matter is usually around, you know, two and a half to 3%. I think in our case, you know, with the complement that Marcia is looking for in terms of full-time and contracted uh, uh, staff to help with recruitment, uh, we want to drive that number down significantly from where we are right now. So, uh, and if I've got it wrong, Marshall will correct me, but I thought we were, you know, by the end of the year, we want to be in around 4%. That's correct. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you for the chair. That's our actual target to be 4% um, as part of our hiring plan. So that will, so if we continue the, the rate we are, that will give us that. that. And that number is consistent with, um with what the like i think what we've heard in the past did we budget for four percent though because like it seems like we're budgeting for ten percent if i'm not mistaken right at the, off the top it says full-time equivalent positions currently in the city of toronto and currently filled if we're budgeting to actuals do, what did, what do we budget for do we budget for four percent vacancy or ten percent vacancy so this is uh, Heather and or Steve, I think, and from- uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Councillor, what we did was we have a set of assumptions as to when the hiring will occur. So at any given moment throughout the year, you're going to have a different vacancy rate based on the exits, the internal hires, and the volume of actual external hires. So it's not as if we've used 4% or 10% throughout the year. We've, we've moved away from what the terminology you're using of gapping. What we've said is based on the outcomes, 
What's the staffing complement we need? And when do we expect to hire them? And the budgets have been based specifically on the timing of when we expect to hire them. I, 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 I totally get that. I, I'm trying to get us back to this old uh, uh, terminology because it's an easy way of measuring sort of how, how much of a year worth of work are we getting out of all these individuals? Because it's easy to budget for additional staff when you're hiring them in, the, in December. It's like that. That's where I, I'm trying to better establish how we are benchmarked to, to other years. And I, I'm just that's what I was hoping this this briefing note would tell me. But now, now based on the the answer from the city manager, it's like the compliment the 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 numbers that are in the page one. Um, aren't exactly illustrative of what we're budgeting for. So you're we're not budgeting for the full complement. We're not budgeting for the current complement. We're budgeting for somewhere in between. Chris, do you want me to take that? Okay, so through you, Mr. Chair, and again, Councillor, it's probably not an answer you want to hear, but because of COVID, we actually are doing a catch up. We are not only uh, using resources to do hiring for COVID related backfills, but we have a COVID backlog as well as we have to tackle, you know, the COVID recovery. So again, a very challenging year to dig out of where, where COVID has, has landed us. So to say that this is a normal year for uh, budgeting vacancies is, is challenging. I, I and I com I completely accept that and I think that is a valid answer and we're doing quite well in 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 our efforts to overcome the challenges from COVID. So I will accept that as a reasonable answer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff, I've heard about this ten percent, five percent, four percent, and I heard the reason because due to COVID is one of the reasons. Are there other Pressures other than COVID that you are that the city is uh, having uh, for this challenge of this uh, vacancy here. So uh, through the chair, thank you, Councillor. Uh, so I think uh, in the briefing note we uh, highlight a number of areas. So one of them was the increase for our exit rate in the last year. Uh, the second one is the one to how we actually will fill roles. So we fill a lot of our roles, majority of our roles internally. And then you'll see that there's about three key points that directly relate to the last two years, um, which is a pandemic. Um, we've had to redeploy staff, obviously, to support um, essential and critical services. Uh, we see that there's increased requirement in terms of the type of work that we deliver. So therefore, we have to make sure that we visual staff and we get staff in as quick as possible to be able to deliver those new services. Uh, and then we also have this compression that we had in the first year where we saw where we actually slowed down our hiring and we made sure that, you know, all staff were, were really at our front lines to support the efforts there. And that's had a knock on effect and we've worked through that. I mean, although it doesn't look great, we've actually stabilized. Uh, we haven't increased our vacancy rate, which is actually a really good achievement. Uh, and it's testament to us being able to identify and know that we have to do things in a different way. And that's when we do some new ways of working to meet that. So there are a number uh, of pressures and they continue. Okay. For non-union staff, um, my understanding is that their compensation was, uh, was frozen. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we had to actually, uh, COLA was frozen for the past two years. That's correct. So what are the intentions this year? Still keeping frozen? No, we have a recommendation to actually bring COLA back, the cost of living allowance back this year. Okay, so they are going to get something this year. It's in the budget. Uh, if, if, if it goes through budget, absolutely. Yeah. So is the, is the city increasingly at a disadvantage with neighboring municipalities and the private sector overcompensation? Yes, if I can, through the chair, just uh, be clear when we, when we say We've uh, frozen increases to the non-union, certainly COLA, certainly pay for performance, and then movement within the pay bands themselves. And uh, we are uh, very aware, and I think your previous question, Councillor, uh, there's a couple of other things I think are critically important to uh, keep in mind. Uh, one is certainly we have a 
uh, an aging workforce. Uh, so you have a, a number of people uh, in the baby boomer range that are making decisions. And, and I would submit that uh, COVID has not helped uh, in, in, in keeping people here in the sense that, you know, there's been a lot of pressure and I think that's contributing exactly how much I can't tell you because I, I don't know, but I think that's a factor. And then the other factor is, is I think where your question leads us to is our competitiveness. And uh, so certainly uh, if we do not address that, uh, we are going to fall behind and we'll be losing high skill individuals uh, in a number of different service areas to other municipalities, but we don't have to go any further. If you look at your chief uh, people and, and equity officer who went to a, a, a different institution. So we are losing ground to not just municipal competitors, but private sector as well as uh, institutional. So uh, we are working with a, a firm right now that is uh, skilled in helping us look at our financial system uh, making sure that we remain competitive, uh, that we don't continue to lose ground. And uh, it's the same organization that helped the province of Ontario. And they'll be reporting to me uh, the recommendations of which I would uh, will be wanting to move forward with. Um, I think if you notice, there is a, a recommendation related to the city manager, which uh, allows me to uh, make sure that we don't continue to lose ground. Um, because you're right. I mean, we have other municipalities that have caught up to us and have exceeded us in certain areas in terms of their competitiveness and Toronto in trying to recruit. Uh, it's critically important that people come to an organization that they want to work for, but they have to be treated fairly. And that is so important. Uh, and if we don't treat them fairly and fairly sometimes means money, but it also means that they're working uh, for an employer that uh, fundamentally cares about them. Uh, does want to give them opportunities to work across and up and down an organization so they can have a phenomenal career. So these are all the things that uh, are very much top of mind for me and for, uh, you know, for P&E, so Marsha, as well as senior leadership team and on. And if we don't do this and we fall further behind, uh, it's going to be awfully hard to recruit. Uh, even if you have the best recruiters in the world, you have to be competitive. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. I'm, I'm very happy that you're on top of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Nunzi, I didn't see questions. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, yeah just one question. Um, Marcia mentioned uh, that uh, there's been a slowdown in hiring. Um, is that, I mean, you know, during the uh, uh, pandemic, is that, that because there's a lack of interest? So, through the Chair, just to be clear, this was uh, in response to the initial uh, start of the pandemic back in 2020, where we had to reassign staff to deliver uh, critical services. So we actually internally looked at slowing down the hiring. So it wasn't due to candidates or anything in terms of that side. It was a more strategic um, uh, initiative to ensure that we could meet the needs of the wider corporation. Okay, so, but as far as hiring, there is an interest um, out there, people wanting um, oh. for jobs or? Oh, absolutely. We, yeah. we, have, we have some of our frontline staff, we're having like 20,000 applicants that our, our teams have to go through. So there is no shortage of interest uh, in terms of our roles, which is great news, keeps our teams very, very busy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson, did you have a question, I believe? I, yes, Mr. Chair, good morning and, and thank you. I'm here on another matter, but um, I thought I'd ask a question around mental health um, uh, funding and uh, preparation. I, I think that we will see, uh, based on all the indications that we've seen now, that there is going to be a rise in challenges there. I understand the um, the issue in terms of addressing the comparative um, challenges that we face in terms of paying salaries and so on compared to other municipalities as well. But what are we doing? How are we planning for an increase um, of pressure and challenges that we'll face, we'll be facing with our employees de dealing with mental health through, uh, through COVID? So through the chair, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Thompson. 
So that this is one of our most critical, just as just as much as we're focusing on obviously having the right number of people in delivering services to ensure that we, uh, you know, maintain uh, a healthy workforce. And so a lot of time and energy has been spent as it did from the beginning, as it continues now, we've increased our spending in this area in terms of uh, providing uh, support to our staff, providing culturally specific services as well, so that it reflects our staff, as well as doing some additional programming around this area. And more recently have brought in a dedicated resource into our team uh, in occupational health to actually focus on that, on terms of ensuring that we have the right resources. Uh, we've also worked with our managers and employees to put uh, tools through our learning system so that people can get resources when they need it and to help them and, and encourage our managers to really be asking that question and checking in with their, their team. So it's a very much a corporate uh, management, something that we're doing, but also investing in funding in terms of making sure that we have a specialized uh, team uh, staff that can really look into what else we need to do. So we'll continue to make sure we, we provide those uh, support services. Thank you very much for that. And, and I guess, um, Chris, to you uh, specifically, um, often we hear that, um, you know, financial reward isn't the only thing that employees are looking at and employers are creating other types of um, incentive opportunities and so on. What are you considering or have you been considering this as, as, as a perhaps an option or an additional tool uh, to create incentives and to create an environment where people really want to work in the city of Toronto? Because some of the things I, I hear from those who are leaving is that they say to me that, well, you know, I'm going to another municipality because the environment is different and it's not just about the money, although it is about the money. So I'm just curious as to whether or not you have some thoughts and ideas and what planning and preparation are you putting in place in terms of trying to address this as a uh, challenge and an opportunity for us? So if I can through the chair, I so appreciate that question because you're absolutely right. Um, compensation is one factor. It's an important factor. Uh, and people generally want to be treated fairly financially, especially when they know what others are paying for the exact same kind of service, whether it be a municipality, it be a private sector company and not for profit. So money is important, not, not disputing that. The organization that they work for and what, what the leadership uh, is, is all about. And we started a few years ago looking at um, what do we expect from our leaders, how they treat people, how they evaluate people's performance, how they do their job matters tremendously. And it's not enough to be smart. Uh, in terms of having an encyclopedic knowledge of the subject area you're responsible for. It's your character as well. So we're spending time with our corporate leadership group, making sure that we're clear on the kind of people that we're uh, putting in those key positions. And so that creates an environment uh, that I think is really important for someone who is making a decision to join the city of Toronto. So uh, I'm placing emphasis on that. Uh, uh, along with the, the matter you just brought up in terms of the other services that are available to help people when they struggle or when maybe members of their family struggle. And I think it's that kind of um, holistic approach, creating a wonderful work environment for someone to be successful, having clear outcomes that you're hoping to achieve, giving people the means by which to do their work and do it well, all in an environment where they're supported, uh, that they can work safely and they can work effectively. Um, it's that total package is what you have to do. So your earlier, the, the first part of your comment about money, yeah, it, it does matter. People at the end of the day do want to be treated fairly, especially when they know what they could be making elsewhere. But this is the city of Toronto. We've led on so many different things and we need to, as an employer, be a leader as well. And uh, part of that is a quantitative thing, but I can tell you it's just as important that it's a qualitative thing. And I, and I can tell you just the way that, especially more senior you are in your organization, um, you know, we work with council and uh, just our relationship matters a lot to people who are making decisions to join us here. And so uh, how we work together is so important and it sends such an important message to people that, uh, you know, we have a strong council that has vision, uh, gives us great challenges to have to focus on, and then we go find the people that can do it, treat them well, treat them with respect, 
and uh, typically good things happen. So I know that's a long answer, but uh, as you can probably tell, there's many of us that feel quite passionate about creating that kind of workplace for people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Seeing no uh, questions, uh, I believe just small point. Chair. Sorry. Uh, the chair. Yeah, I, I was going to, I was going to, Marsha, you'd had a point. You have to uh, correct. Go ahead. Yeah, just one point of clarity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the, this council asked a question around um, the ability to attract uh, candidates to positions. I just wanted to clarify that uh, with our union positions, we get uh, those huge numbers coming through in terms of those um, non-unions. Again, it's very dependent on the role. Uh, we do have a healthy candidate list, but actually getting them right through to the process offers sometimes is where the challenge is. So just wanted to clarify that uh, it's not necessarily the thousands that we get in others, and we are operating in a very competitive market. Thank you for the correction. Um, seeing no other questions on this briefing note, Steve, I think we have one more. Yep, uh, and the last briefing note comes to us from the uh, uh, Toronto and Region uh, Conservation Authority. It's briefing note number 19 in your package is entitled The Meadow Way. It looks like everybody is comfortable with that one. That's it. And that's it for the briefing notes and the supplementary report. So I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Councillor. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Now is the time, I guess, part of the process is sort of winding down questions. Just there, are there any overall? So there'll be another one more opportunity for any overall questions of the uh, 2022 budget. I know, Councillor Thompson, you are visiting us and you had some questions. So I'll recognize you first. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff. I wanted to ask questions around the RAE program, the um, the actual need for it, and uh, where are we with respect to our recommendation? I understand that certainly this is in the provincial jurisdiction. First of all, I wanted to give, maybe just give a quick recap as to what the RAE program is and, and what the status of this particular program is for uh, 2022, because we funded the pilot last year, but are we prepared to fund provide additional funding for that program. Uh, thank you for the question, Deputy Mayor Thompson, through uh, the chair. So the BRAVE program uses a public health and trauma-informed approach to for violence um, prevention by um, having uh, social workers within hospital setting uh, work with um, victims of gun violence at this point. Um, although there is a strong interest to extend that to uh, victims of knife uh, violence as well. Um, and you're absolutely right that um, through budget in 20, um, oh, which year last year, we were able to provide Sunnybrook um, Hospital with some funding to uh, launch and develop uh, their version of BRAVE. Uh, and they've been able to, I think, be quite successful with um, addressing uh, 67 victims of uh, 42 gunshots and 27 uh, were stabbed, were victims of stabbings. Since then, um, other hospitals, including St. Michael's, has um, expressed an interest in creating uh, their own models, as well as uh, there is interest from Scarborough uh, General, as well as Humber River. You, you are absolutely right, um, Deputy Mayor, that through SafeTO and Council Direction, we asked the Ministry of Health to fund the BRAVE program and the other um, similar hospital violence uh, intervention programs. And on January 31st, I received a letter from the Ministry of Health saying that they don't currently have a funding envelope that's appropriate, and so they will not be funding these programs. The challenge, of course, is that we now have a legislated um, community safety and well-being plan that calls on such intersections across systems um, and we need programs like BRAVE um, and the other hospital intervention programs to continue to exist. Through your research and work, um, and I guess the um, work at Sunnybrook, Dr. Nathan's and, and others there, 
um, as well as the police information that's coming through to us, as well as just the overall news that we have in the city. Um, would it be safe to say that we've seen a dramatic increase with respect to gun crimes, um, combination of both victims are being shot and um, shots and bullets flying in general? So we see an increase in that and it would be unwise for us not to fund the BRAVE program at this time. So I always have to say, Deputy Mayor Thompson, I'm not an expert on uh, on gun violence overall in the city. However, um, Toronto Police would be better to give uh, specific details, but I, I think you're absolutely right that there is a general increase um, and we are all looking for better um, more effective ways of um, stemming gun violence in the city because there's certainly it's certainly having devastating impacts on communities, particularly black uh, community. And so we we need uh, programs like this. We need partners like the hospital working with us as council just approved us to create a Toronto office to prevent gun violence and to develop a, a comprehensive gun violence strategy working with police and other systems. Thank you. I, I have most of those numbers that I asked, so I'm, okay. I'm aware that the numbers are quite high. Um, so just a just final point on this. Um, with respect to the BRAVE program, uh, the intervention that takes place takes place in the hospital settings where someone is maybe shot. And um, part of the objective is to reduce the opportunity of them being further victimized and being victimized as well as creating opportunities where they're aware of programs and um, initiatives that can actually help them to advance their lives and reduce their risk for being further victimized. Would that be correct? Yes, absolutely, Deputy Mayor Thompson. And in 2019, Toronto Public Health actually uh, presented a report. Um, I think it was at the direction, your leadership and the direction of economic development to look into these types of programs. And so definitely spoke to their evaluation was that these types of programs appear to be uh, relevant and feasible for Toronto and certainly since then have been having positive impact. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, any other overall questions of the budget? It's an opportunity, but uh, Councillor Farrell. Uh, yes, and and I it's to the same staff, I believe. Um, I just want to ask a question because I know I know at some point in this budget process we're we're going to try and uh, um, fix the situation we have, whereby um, our various grant streams under CPIP. Um, they have a smaller inflationary increase than has been allowed uh, across some of the divisions. And um, there's a there's a move afoot to move a motion to change that. But I'm just wondering um, what what the impact of that is. Um, we at one point we we you know there's still a thing called CPIP, but it actually goes out to all the various departments. And so uh, will it just go out on a, a straight equity basis, uh, uh, we'll just sort of prorate it and, and the dollars will go out to the various divisions at a, on a 1% basis if we were to do that inflationary increase, or would it go back to to your department that sort of oversees CPIP to, to target the additional resources? Oh, sorry, you're, you're on mute. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so through the last budget process, I would say that um, different divisions uh, took a different approach um, to how we responded to um, the question of inflationary increases, at least through this last budget process. Um, and I think moving forward, so partly through the questions that you've asked of myself and Steve Conforti, um, that we have an interest to ensure that we just have a consistent approach um, moving forward. And so there's some more work to be done. We've certainly looked at, we're looking right now at other jurisdictions to understand better what they do. But at this point, it seems that Toronto is fairly unique in um, applying uh, an inflationary increase um, using whatever method uh, 
both methods that we've used in the past. And so Steve and I have agreed that we've got some uh, consistent work to do uh, to make sure that whatever uh, we do moving forward is, um, is, you know, is transparent, applies to us, and is taken into account by the other granting divisions. Oh, okay. So, so whether it's the 1% that's built in there now, or we find a way to make it 2.1%, the work to figure out how they will apply it um, to to create the greatest effect. Hi there. <laughs> um, uh, the work will is already ongoing, so you would be able to absorb the the. Uh, if we got positive news for you, you'd be able to absorb it because you're already thinking that through. Uh, yes, and Steve is okay. here. I see him. In case there's anything he'd like to add, he's good. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions, overall questions on the budget? Okay, seeing none. Um, members, what we'll do is we'll we'll take a 30 minute, it, we're a little bit early for lunch, so I'm gonna propose if we just take a 30 minute recess. Oh, Councillor Thompson, sorry. Uh, Mr. Chair, just on uh -huh. point of order. Uh, I do have to leave, I have a motion. I just wonder if you could take carriage of that motion for me. I just simply wanted to move it and just to thank the staff and just to say how important this particular program uh, is that it is funded, but we want to expand it uh, beyond simply um, Sunnybrook, Scarborough, and Etobicoke and other areas and so on, and staff are looking at that work. Now, regrettably, I can't come back in the next little while, so I'm wondering if, if it would be okay for you to just do Yeah, no, take care no of it's it's a brief and note request. Uh, that's, that, that's correct. That'll, move, yeah. that'll come to executive or council. No, I'll move that on your behalf, Councillor. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Take care. Thanks. So, as I was saying, um, it's a little a little early for lunch. So, if, if it's okay, we could take a, just a half hour recess and come back at about um, 10 to 12 or so. Would that work? Okay, just 30 minutes, 30, 35 minutes or so. We can come back about 10 to 12 and we'll begin speaking. Okay, thanks everyone. See you in a bit. I'm just trying to raise my colleague here. Yes, this is the host. Uh, if you can give me a moment, the stream will resume. Okay, great. I only say that I see the two of us here, um, Mr. Chair. Oh, I see you all. You're on my screen here. That's the that's the main part. Thank you, everyone. I think we are resumed. Um, for the last uh, little section of the, the 2022 budget. Um, we're gonna go to speaking. Um, traditionally, we go to any, I don't know if, if there are any outside uh, councillors who are with us today. My councillor Thompson was, but he had to leave. So if there are any outside councillors who wish to speak, please let me know. Okay, if not, um, I, I'll speak first, uh, if that's okay, and then we'll go to two other members. <clears throat> um, Mr. Clerk, I do have a, a couple of motions that I'd like to, up. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, we'll, we'll place them on the screen um, and okay. uh, we'll cycle through them as you're speaking. Okay, perfect. I believe the first one has to do with um, the CFO's announcement of the extra $3 million at City Gas. So we'll wait to get it up there. And the first motion is up there now, Mr. Chair. Okay, it's City Council amend the 2020 operating 2022 operating budget to include a $3 million reduction in non-program expenditures arising from the targeted savings achieved from the cooperative purchasing arrangements with an offset of $3 million in the non-program expenditures available for emerging 2022 operating priorities. <clears throat> Second one is a briefing note request in consultation with the Chief Financial Officer to provide a briefing note to the February 11th Executive Committee uh, a note uh, titled continued, is that the one there? Yeah, continued COVID-19 support funding from federal provincial governments, potential impacts of the inadequate 2022 funding support out, outlining the anticipated impact on each division and agency's capital budgets. 
Third is on behalf of Councillor Thompson, um, the Executive Director of SDFA, part of briefing note to Executive on the importance of hospital-based violence intervention programs to the goals of Safety O, and on how to term city support, how short-term city support can enable expansion of the program to Scarborough and Etobicoke. You are can better integrate these programs, and I believe there's one more. Um, again, briefing note request on opportunities to increase immediate access to housing solutions for people in shelters. Let's get that up. And then again, um, okay, I think that's everything. Uh, I'll be moving. <clears throat> I'll be moving the the staff recommended uh, budget. Uh, first of all, I do want, of course, when, when you go through a process like this, there are a lot of people to thank, and I know we've thanked a lot of people during the during the process. Uh, first off, City Manager Chris Murray, uh, CFO Heather Taylor, Executive Director of Financial Planning Steve Conforti, and everyone, your entire teams, all below you and around you, everyone who supported you, I want to thank. You for the work that you've done and bring us here, of course, uh, Louis Savillas from the, the mayor's office. Um, I want to thank all the, the committee um, members, of course, coming out. Um, you always learn uh, how the city works, the budget, um, when you when you see how the dollars are spent. So I want to thank you and all you work, and along with any, uh, the mayor came out and a number of visiting councillors who also came out. Also want to thank the public. It's been a challenging couple of years with COVID, but we had almost 150 people come out virtually to uh, our public deputations. <clears throat> along with uh, hundreds, if not thousands of emails that I think we all received. So I want to thank the public for coming out and participating in our process. This is a, a fiscally responsible budget that protects services as well as making important investments um, where they're needed, absolutely needed. Um, when you look at the budget before us um, that we'll be um, recommending, um, keeps property taxes at the rate of inflation. It continues to to deliver the largest COVID-19 vaccination plan in Canadian history. In this budget, we're gonna be supporting um, in, in historic actually investments in emotion-centered care uh, model that we run uh, with our uh, 10 city long-term care homes. We're gonna be hiring 68 new paramedics. Uh, we're lowering business taxes um, to small businesses by 15%. We're, we are restoring by the end of the year, but we are still restoring hopefully uh, service to our pre-pandemic levels. Uh, we have freezed transit fares, while at the same time we've increased the overall subsidy to the TTC. There is in this budget um, an increase to Toronto Arts Council to help support the struggling arts community. And of course, um, our continued investments in climate change and equity and inclusion, public health, shelters, housing, um, cybersecurity, which is really, really important. Um, along with uh, the, the recovery and rebuilding aspect of what we need to do. Um, it's fiscally responsible. Um, we have $1.6 billion of ineffic inefficiencies that we've managed to do over the last three years, almost $500 million in this budget. Um, and this budget could not have been balanced if it was not for the support of the other levels of government. And I really want to thank on this part of it, the mayor and his team, uh, Louis, of course, we mentioned, and Luke Robertson, for the intergovernmental work that has been happening primarily behind the scenes, but it's been an incredibly part, important part of not only the last two budgets, but this budget alone. Um, and again, I want to thank them. I want to thank the level, the uh, government of Canada, and of course the government of Ontario, for continuing to provide funding for us to be able to provide our, you know, services, protecting our services, and investing in the crucial, crucial areas that we need. Um, there's 1.4 billion dollars in this budget. Um, we do not have commitments at this point. We are hoping that the commitments come through, but again, as we are moving forward and balancing the budget, we have to recognize that those um, those supports, even though they've been there in the year past, they are not quite there yet. Our hope is that they will be coming um, as soon as possible, but ideally before the uh, the 17th. Um, again, I want to say thank quickly thank the CFO for finding that uh, three million dollars in projected savings that can be used for emergent operating. Uh, priorities, but I'm not going to be supporting or moving any motions today that are going to impact what that will look like. I think that's really a responsibility now of full council to have a look at that. Um, so I won't be supporting. I don't think there are any motions coming today, but I wouldn't be supporting them anyway. For the first time in eight years, this is um, a budget where we haven't at committee made any adjustments or any increases to the budget. Um, and I think that's a testament, frankly, to to the incredible work that the city manager has done in providing a really strong, balanced budget. 
Um, so I want to thank him for, for moving that. And again, it's a good budget. It's a balanced budget. Um, but I don't think it's the time at budget committee, um, nor executive, but primarily at budget committee in the financial challenges that we're facing and the fact that we don't have commitments at the 1.4 billion to making any increases in, in any way. So I won't be supporting any motions that will be doing any of that. And on that, I just want to thank everybody for coming out the time and effort and all the work that you've been doing over the last number of months to uh, do the budget. Thank you. Other speakers, Councillor Layton. Would you take it as a friendly amendment? I, I, I see you have here a, a motion in, um, I don't know who it's on behalf of, but to request some information about how to shelter people more effectively out of, um, uh, it put people in housing out of shelters. I asked for a similar briefing note about what it would take uh, to, to do that at the first uh, or the last meeting, I don't know, before the wrap up, uh, before the public sessions. Um, would you be adverse to including some of those requests specifically about housing allowances and um, uh, and the cost of funding additional support to help people live independently? Would you, would you enter? Um, it seems to me like you'll support this and mine was quite, quite similar in that it was just was more specific in the information. Um, I appreciate it. I think, thanks, Councillor. I would prefer just um, moving this motion here without the attachments uh, that you'd mentioned, if that's uh, okay with you. Do you know where it's different from, from my motion? Because um, I, except for now they have two less weeks to write it. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I haven't reviewed it in-, in You haven't, okay. Okay, okay, that's fine. If you don't, if you don't know what it is, you'll be supporting and what you oppose, then that's fine. Well, well, I do know what I'm supporting. So, okay. Um, next speaker, Councilor, did you want to speak or? I'll speak. Sure. Um, I have uh, a couple of motions. The clerk can put them up. Uh, yep. Here we are. Just uh, displaying. Number one, that Mr. Chair, if I could just ask um, that the motion stay on the screen for I'm I'm at a disadvantage today because my CMP isn't working. So as long as they're up long enough for me to read, thanks. Okay, no problem. First, that the city manager increased the 2021 staff recommended operating budget for MLS by 2.6 million gross and net to support the expansion of rent safe and multi tenant housing inspections and decrease the recommended operating budget for the TPS by 2.6 million. Scroll down how, to the housing secretariat city council direct the city manager to communicate to the provincial government in the strongest sense of urgency, the request for funds to ensure that the city of Toronto can meet its goal of a minimum of 2000 new supportive units in 2022 and city council authorized city manager to use any additional resources available to advertise or otherwise communicate to the general public, the need for the provincial government to help the city of Toronto achieve such a supportive housing target. Three, that city council requests city manager to provide a comprehensive report prior to this to the set provincial election date in the second quarter of 2022 that includes the status of funding secured for supportive housing funding for the province. And then finally, to energy and environment, city council direct the um, executive director, environment and energy in consultation with chief financial officer and treasurer as part of the climate lens program to establish a process of identifying projects that produce net positive and net negative impacts, increased greenhouse gas emissions at the time of the project's consideration for including a, an assessment of climate impacts, providing details on the methodology and results used in the assessment in order to help prioritize funding projects. Now, the 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 uh, the the chief I'm the chief planner, the a uh, chief <laughs> budget chief is is right in that like all things considered, this is a good budget. Um, we have. Uh, uh, we we have managed to increase in some very core spaces that uh, that that the budget chief outlined. I would like to point out um, one more, and that's our investment in in di indigenous reconciliation, which has a significant bump in this year. One that we have only seen once before when we established the Indigenous Affairs Office, and I think that some of those gains uh, we should recognize, and we've done so in such a way without um, seeing a significant decrease in uh, uh in in specific services where i think that we're starting to see challenges though and 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 i don't know about all of you but i hear it all the time from our residents that we're not moving fast enough on some of their priorities and we're simply not able and we're being told no or we can't afford it 
more often than we're being we're being told yes that this can fit into an existing budget and i'm not talking for the frills for the the nice to haves we're talking very basic things around uh, around trying to make a safer city, which we've committed to, make a more resilient and a sustainable city, which we're committed to, as well as making a more fair and just city with respect to our um, our unhoused residents, uh, as well as those tenants that are currently in housing but precariously housed. Um, so it's yet, in my mind, it's yet another year of holding the line. There are those at council that will argue that's a good thing during a pandemic. I would argue that it's quite the opposite, that this is the exact moment in time when governments should be spending more in order to advance the social, uh, social and environmental agenda. And further to that, we're missing key investments, investments that have been identified as necessary over the many decades, uh, but we're just unable to commit to spending because of our lack of resources. Um, I pointed to that in my questions around the long term financial plan that we're actually falling even further behind uh, in achieving in order to get to that city building prowess that we wanted to get to and that we uh, 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 that we strive to be. Um, I won't be mo moving an omnibus motion as we have in the past. I expect more motions will come later at council, uh, but I have introduced motions on some areas that I think deserve more consideration in this budget and beyond. The three areas are funding supportive housing, protecting tenants, and fighting climate change. Anyone dying on our streets is unacceptable, but the fact that the number is e increasing year to year is 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 not on not only disappointing. It's 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 fundamentally heartbreaking to me as a policymaker to have been on this council as we've seen those deaths increase. Now, many of them are due to the uh, the lack of supports for people struggling with drug addiction, um, the, but the some of those underlying causes that are leading people to dying in our streets of overdoses are based on uh, on, on how we treat the most uh, the most struggling in our society, either poverty or mental health or otherwise. And that's something that we need to address, but we can't do it alone, which is why we need the provincial government to to come to the table. This is health care dollars that need to be spent. We can help find land, secure units, all the administrative agreements. But if we don't have those money for supports, we're going to see people out on the street next year that are currently in housing, getting supports are going to be in our hospital. Uh, in our in our hospital emergency rooms, we can't have that. The dignified and the financially responsible way is deal is 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 addressing it with supportive housing, and we need to be doubling down on that on every occasion. Second, on the uh, on 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 protecting tenants. You know, I had a fire just around the corner of my house with a building with many people on OW is OD and ODSP uh, parents with kids that have kids in my kids' school, and they uh, had a fire. It lost everything. They were living in a hotel, but just a couple days in, it's the city's programs run out and it's back to this landlord that had several infractions against him of the fire code and through um, other MLS uh, infractions that existed. There was no work that was being done to rectify those. We need staff that can push those landlords to resolve those, identify them early, resolve them quickly, result in keeping people in their homes. Now those people have nothing and they're put back in the hands of the individual who they blame for 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 putting them in this in this crisis situation. That's just wrong. It's wrong and we need to do better. I think through funding MLS appropriately and making sure that we can reduce those those um, uh, those uh, those standards uh, for response that we can help achieve that. Finally, on climate. Um, I was hope I I had heard uh, through a different uh, uh, differently that our planning staff and our uh, our EED staff didn't have the necessary resources to perform the work. Um, we do often hear that from staff that say you've just layered on too many policy pieces for us to uh, get through. We didn't hear that today. It was disappointing because I would have moved money uh, into addressing that. Um, however, I think this climate lens and ensuring that we use the climate lens more effectively is incredible is going to be an incredible tool in telling us where we should be putting our money and where we shouldn't in the future. I would just finally say I'd like to thank the budget chief and all um, the budget staff for the opportunity to serve on the budget committee uh, these past four years, this past term, in fact, the past two terms. Um, I have found it very enlightening. I have found it very um, uh, uh, very educational. Uh, I, I, I would, though, say one thing that 
we know we're not making the investments in all the departments that we should. And we know that the requests from those departments are going to the financial staff and senior staff and getting fit into the puzzle pieces. And as it should, sure. But it's extremely different, difficult to move money around, to add money to budgets, despite the importance of those programs uh, if folks aren't asking for it. And if, if the answers are we can do what we can within our existing allotment. It's why some of us counselors pry more and ask for many, many briefing notes. We're denied most of them, which is fine. We know they're hard to do, but we do it because we want to make it easier for you to do your jobs and serve the communities you serve better. Thanks, Councilor. And, and so, thank you. Okay, you, you, you've added a, you had a few credits over the years being on budget to get to speak a little bit further, so. Mr. Chair, I have, I have a question of uh, Councilor Layton on the, on motion number one. Okay, go ahead. Can, can Clerk please uh, post the motion again? My question is, uh, Councillor Layton, are you saying that we will cut the police budget part by 2.6 million and redirect it to the MLS? I, I would say we that's would how I read it. I think a, a fairer characterization is to is to not increase the police budget as much as was requested and instead put it into uh, helping people stay in their homes. So basically it's a 2.6 million from the police budget and then adjust it and give it to MLS. That is sort of like a well, short they technically, answer. They technically don't have the budget yet. So it would be not fulfilling their full budget request by 2.6 million, as you said, and instead pull it, it put it into MLS for, uh, for enforcement of rent safe and and uh, multi-tenant housing. But let's put it this way. If we got to send the police to go accompany the sheriff to escort people out of their housing through an eviction, by avoiding those evictions, we may be saving the TPS money. That's that's kind of the whole point of alternative, uh, alternative programs like our crisis response and us making investments into things like poverty reduction. I, I consider this much of the same. Okay, thank you. Those are my, that was my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor McKelvey, questions? Sorry, question of the mover. Why 2.6? So we were all over the place. Uh, it, at one point in time, it was the number that it would take that we were told it would take to reduce the standard from M MLS. And are you? Does it have to be from the police budget if we find somewhere else to do this? Or some if we way? find somewhere else to do it, I that there that is a distinct possibility. I would probably support that too. In my mind, it we weren't able to change that tax supported number, um, or that the 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 mill rate in the previous item. And what I was trying to do is to highlight the fact that um, that by investing in programs like this as well as programs through SDFA, programs through our affordable housing office, programs through parks and environment and library and all those things, by working on poverty reduction, by working on securing and making, um, making precarious housing less precarious, we're in fact helping address the root cause causes of violence, therefore less requirement for police. Okay, thank you. Thank you, any other questions of the mover? Okay, any other speakers? Councillor Carroll. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't I don't have motions to move today. I have concerns in the budget, but not that many. Um, generally, usually I have a list, a long list. But with respect to the city, I don't have many concerns. I do have concerns about uh, the fact that uh, our financial calendar can't really be met by the other orders of government such that we really know our destiny. It would be easier to know what we could do in this budget um, in terms of adjustments that, that are needed. The community highlights them every year. Um, it would be easier to do that if only the other governments had responded. And I, and I especially want to highlight the provincial government at this point. Uh, we're, we're waiting on a federal government who has, has uh, um, agreed at the outset to, to help make us whole so that we could run the whole transit system, even though we don't have its whole ridership on, on board. Um, but I, I want to make a special note uh, to say that the financial service sector continues to, to evaluate on a per capita basis 
what provincial governments are spending to mitigate the effects of COVID and to prepare for, for uh, recovery. And on a per capita basis, our province is still spending the least. The least. Granted, uh, the, two, the two lowest are, are ourselves in British Columbia. And granted, there's an economy of scale when most of your impact is in a big city. They could still be doing more to make sure that that the for what are now for some families lifelong impacts were being being mitigated and invested in as soon as possible, uh, and that's not happening. And so I'm loath to to suggest adjustments, but I am hoping that you know by the time we get to special budget council, we'll have our our full picture. We've already heard from from the CFO. She is she is turning over every rock looking for. For anything that 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 might be usable to, to to mitigate those same impacts, and it's already come up with something in procurement. One hopes that um, the last uh, uh, surplus statement and the the most up to date information on land transfer might might give us uh, uh, some money by uh, by the time we're in special budget council, such that we could address things that I think are important. And I I, I don't think I'm alone in this at all. I think we all agree that we'd like to be giving uh, those organizations that through grants serve our communities uh, in ways that, that city staff would not be able to do affordably at all. And so to grant them the same inflationary increase that we are giving divisions only makes sense. They have food costs, they have fuel costs and, and uh, uh, deal with some of the same challenges we do. And so it would be good to be able to, uh, to up that, but we still need to hear from our other orders of government before we know that we can help those agencies. Um, the, uh, the, the motion we moved earlier in council and, and still needs to be addressed. I've, I've gone to the trouble of asking um, uh, Ms. Campbell, Denise Campbell and SDF&A, um, if those neighborhood improvement area, uh, the two that need to be added, St. Jamestown, the peanut, which is in my ward, there are two that were, that were just outside the loop the very first time we had a priority neighborhood place-based strategy. And uh, because we could only afford so many, we said, we'll catch them in the next round. And that was 12 years ago. They're still waiting. And they are actually two neighborhoods that have been hardest hit by the, the uh, uh, recent economic uh, crisis. We are in this budget doing the good news piece, and that is putting in the money to kickstart and get the NIAs that exist back to work. But there are two that are still waiting and won't benefit from that at all. And that, that, that is St. James Town and, and the Peanut Parkway Forest area. So I'm hoping to be able to address that at the end to start the work so that it would be substantial in 2023, it would only be 150 grand. But let's wait and see what our other governments have in store for us. And lastly, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I can't support Councillor Layton's motion. Um, we're in the transition year. It's frustrating, but it's going to cost money to make the transition to non-police responses that we are making right now. And taking the police budget and without much forethought saying, and by the way, we're scooping the money right now when we're in the transition and they need to continue to deliver while we pilot the non-police strategy. I think is irresponsible. Yes, we're getting to exactly what Councillor Layton described in, in, in pulling some tasks out of there, but it's not done yet. And we jeopardize that work if we start to play around with it before those things are in place. And that's why I can't support it. And rent safe, to add the money to rent safe willy-nilly, we had, a, we had a, a coordinated way of adding that money to rent safe before us earlier this or past year in 2021. If I'm not mistaken, I'm the only person on this committee that voted in favor of adding the staff then with a coordinated response, the conditional path system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, we decided not to do that. So to now just add money into rent safe and not have that fee structure that says some of the money to pay for staff and rent safe should be coming from the landlords themselves. That was what was before us. And too many of council voted against it. Only four voted for it. And so now to do it, on the fly is very uncomfortable for me. I would like to see rent safe come back to us in 2022, but it needs to be in a way that staff are really coordinated and ready to bring to us. And there has to be some hit for the landlord, not just a hit on our budget. 
Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Mr. Councilor. For my comments. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councilor Lai, and then Nanziata. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, like you said, uh, Mr. Chair, for your for you uh, heading this committee and also for staff and all the people that you just thanked and I just don't want to repeat repeat it. I do not have a motion at this point, but I like to uh, say something about a few things about uh, the property tax deferral program. And I asked the question of staff, and I think uh, we're still at the tail end of the uh, the COVID nineteen. I think it would be nice for us to have some form of a property tax deferral program for people because I hear a lot of uh, cash poor seniors. They are they are really really into you know they they cannot do it. But maybe even a deferral uh, for a certain amount of time without uh, we can give it to everybody. But I don't know how it works. But I I hope that uh, uh, something could be done on this one. And on the three three million dollars uh, surplus that we just kind of found, find, I would like to see that um, actually for Councillor Layton's motion number one, I kind of support half of it and not the other half. I I support that uh, we should consider giving some more uh, resources to MLS to hire people for the rent safe TO and then for the for the uh, rooming house and uh, uh, multi-tenant housing uh, for the enforcement there. I, I agree that because you know, I've been always asking for more enforcement than that, but I cannot uh, support when it's taking out of the, to the police budget. Like Councillor Carroll said, we are in the, in the, in the middle of doing uh, some pilot programs and, and it's, a, it's a transition year. We cannot uh, kind of uh, do that until such time that we find the pilots are successful. So. Basically, that is so much about uh, Council Layton's motion, and that's why I asked about uh, the question. And the other part of the three million dollars, I would see like to see how it's spent. Well, although we don't have, we don't know where, the, how we're going to spend it yet. But I would like uh, the CFO to consider uh, spending some money on the translation services for multi-language, uh, for communication or education pieces that we need to. Do it for the for for the residents of uh, of Toronto that are a little bit more vulnerable because they're, they're not really proficient in uh, in in the English language and uh, there are other emerging priorities and I I get that so basically I I will look forward to the uh, the special budget uh, meeting this month and then we can kind of fine tune the whole budget and I really appreciate uh, everybody working together staff working together and I will be able to tell. Uh, staff, what our needs are, so for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lai. Councillor Nunziata, next. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I don't agree with Councillor Layton's comment about that this is the year we should increase spending. This is the year that we should not increase spending. In light of the pandemic, and the number of people, businesses that have gone bankrupt, residents that can't pay their property tax, people that have lost their jobs, this is not a time to increase property tax and increase spending. I do agree that uh, we do have a number of slum landlords, as, uh, as, as we all know. And I, I think that what we should be looking at, and we heard that during the deputation as well, um, working in 2022 and maybe increasing some of these fines to these landlords uh, that are, are not complying by the rules and that are not um, working uh, with the city in light of there's been a number of charges against them. Yes, I have quite a few build, uh, buildings in my ward too, but what I've done and I've been very successful on it is that uh, tenants call me directly and I refer them to staff and we've been very successful in resolving some of the outstanding issues that we do have in uh, we have in the building. I will not support uh, Councillor Layton's motion uh, about decreasing the police services budget. As you know, when we heard from the police budget, is that their budget is all staffing, and you know, um, in in light of the number of, uh, of violence that we have in the city, where there's a demand from residents wanting more police presence in our communities. Uh, more neighborhood uh, uh, officers in our community. And, you know, and the police did an amazing job over the weekend with the convoy protest. Um, we all, everybody congratulated city staff and the police on such a peaceful protest, unlike Ottawa. 
Um, can you imagine if we didn't have enough police officers to be there this weekend? What could have happened uh, in the city? Um, so I will not support uh, reducing the police budget. Um, and I, as well, I want to thank the chair and all city staff that were involved in bringing this budget together. Um, and all the departments, I, I, I think that it's a, a balanced budget. Even though we haven't uh, approved the budget, uh, I'm already getting calls from residents that are property taxes going up. And, and so we need to, you know, this is not the year to increase spending and increase property tax. Um, you know, there are still a lot of people out there that don't have jobs and that are having difficulties. And uh, this is not the time um, to uh, overspend. And as far as the $3 million, I think we can look at that at a, at a later uh, time. I don't know I, um, if we should start spending the money. Um, I, I think that that will probably come forward at, at council or during the executive committee. Um, you know, because we found $3 billion, it doesn't mean we have to spend $3 million. Um, so I have to look at that uh, later during the process. Thank you very much, Councillor. Seeing no other speakers, I think, um, Mr. Clerk, what's the next step on process again for, for voting? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you can vote on these in the order that they were presented. Uh, so we can put up your uh, first motion. Um, Sounds good. Motion. I don't mind doing mine in a package if that's Mr. Good. Chair. If if I could, there's a um. Oh, it doesn't need to be a recorded vote. That's that's fine. Oh, okay. Okay. So are we good then? Just doing my motions as a package, or we can do them separately. Whatever. Uh, uh, we can. Uh, we could display we could display them um just for clarity so we so we know what we're voting on okay sounds good okay so we'll put up your motion a i mean and feel free to take a voice votes here okay. can, uh, so why don't we just do a voice so I'll, why don't we just do all in favor i guess i have to see everyone oh yes we'll take what do you want well, no, you can. I mean, you're you're taking a. Why, why don't you just run? Yeah, I'm just instead of going back and forth like okay, this. Okay, Why don't you run through them? We'll just do one vote on them. How's that? Okay, fair enough. So we displayed uh, motion A. We can display motion okay. A now, just uh, for clarity. Okay. okay. And we'll display uh, motion C here. Uh, it? Yeah, it was, oh, it was incorporated into number two. It was incorporated into your number two. Okay. So, yeah. all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. I believe Councillor Layton's motions. Yep, that's correct. I'll, so we'll I'll, place... I'll request a, a recorded vote on number one. Okay, so we'll place uh, Councillor uh, Layton's motion on the screen. Okay, and there's been a request for a recorded vote on number one. Yep. Okay, so uh, all in favor of part one of Councillor Layton's motion. Uh, Councillor Layton. All opposed, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, the Speaker Nunziato, uh, Councillor Lai, Councillor Carroll, Councillor Nunzi, uh, sorry, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, Mr. Chair, that does uh, part one does not carry, and that is uh, uh, five, uh, one to five. Okay, thank you. And would you like a recorded vote on the balance of council? I'm Lincoln? fine, unless okay. anybody else wants it. It's I'm I'm good to do the balance if the councillor is. It's up to him. Okay, Mr. Chair, if you want to take the vote on the balance on the balance. Okay. Do you have I guess you'll have to show them quickly. Yep. Yeah. Can you, can you just show us what the balance is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
Excellent. Okay. Okay. So all in favor of, of those three? Opposed, that's carried. Carried. Now is this just item as amended, I'm assuming? Just to make sure we're Yes. Mr. Chair, yes. on a point of order, I'm trying to figure out how to vote um against the increase in police services budget. I can't figure out how how to do it. Maybe the clerk can give some insight. I it's because it's it's a proposed budget within it, so the increase itself isn't a separate item. Is that right? Well, maybe you can separate the police budget. So here's what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to say it, and then we'll figure it out by council. I'm going to vote against the budget as a whole, just rather than us figuring out how to tease out that one bit, and I'll figure it out in two weeks, just to save us some time. Okay. Unless, unless, Councillor, you, you want to, we could maybe tease out the police component of that. That way, it'll give you an opportunity at least to vote on things you probably. There are support. portions. There are portions of that budget that I I don't take issue with. So oh. that's where I'm kind of I'm kind of inter. Thank you for for the attempt. I'm kind of internally struggling with this at the moment. So just to save us all time, I'll just vote against the budget. But for the record, this is one of the contributing factors: is the increase. So, okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm good with that. Okay, Mr. Chair, um, we can take a recorded vote on uh, BU 45.1, the 2022 capital and operating budgets. Yeah, okay. I've recommended. So, all in favor of the item as amended? Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Speaker, Nandiata, uh, Councillor Lai, Councillor Carroll, Vice Chair McKelvey, all opposed, please? Councillor Layton. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the vote is five to one, and that uh, the item is amended carries. Excellent. Well, I think we're done. Thank you, everyone, um, for the great budget year, challenging as it has been, and uh, uh, thank you for the last four years. Not everybody's oh been here, goodness. but thank, yeah. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> thank another, you, Budget Chief. Another term down. Okay. Anyway, thank you, staff. And thank, thank you, staff. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chief. Appreciate staff, everybody who's helped out on this. It's been a huge team effort. So, onward to executive and full council. Thanks, everyone.